development and literacy development of the kids because they get so engaged in the science problems that they want to talk about them. And they're motivated to express their ideas because the science gets them interested. And then they're motivated to read and write. So one of the important practices of the science classroom, particularly at the elementary level, is having kids keep science notebooks. Science notebooks can, are very informal. So they can write in whatever language they choose to write in. They draw diagrams, they collect data, they keep a record of it. Now, when they're asked to do formal pieces of science writing, they have a basis for which to build that. And even if their notebook is in Spanish, their formal writing is going to be in English, that <coughs> transition is supported because they've done the thinking and they've developed their ideas and to some extent expressed them in English in the classroom. The, the interplay, and, and you'll find for a language learner child, the science notebook will actually be mixed in terms of what languages appear in. Because they're learning new science words and they only know those words in English. And yet they have other words that, that they only know in Spanish. So that's fine, or whatever language it is they, they, they speak it. <coughs> Pick Spanish simply because that's the biggest sample in most schools in California. But figuring out how to support children to transition and to use whatever language resources they have to help develop their English language resources and their science thinking. And to respect the thinking as being the critical piece it means accepting contributions no matter how they're expressed. And then helping move on. So the kid says something which is not really very clear because they haven't expressed it clearly. The teacher has options like saying, well, I think what I heard you say is such and such. Is that what you meant? That's accepting the contribution. It's giving an example of reframing that might suggest better ways to say it to the kid, but not saying, you didn't say it right. This is the way you should say it. It helps a lot to really, and then to allow the, the students among one another to use that tool. Well, I didn't quite understand you. Can you try again? Or I think I heard you say this. Modeling the things you want students to do in student-to-student -student discourse as part of the teacher-to-student interaction. Asking questions to prompt. A student has expressed a little bit of an idea. And you say, and does that mean? Or, and, and how can you tell us a little more about that? Or whatever it is you need to ask. So using questioning strategies that support not just the science learning, but also the language expression and the language inclusion of the student in the classroom. Very, very important. And this frame of three-dimensional science learning provides a lot of opportunities for that. So let's think about it. In the science classroom, how do you learn science? Well, you have to have opportunities to practice applying the ideas in the context of real problems. Right? The ideas in the abstract don't have much meaning for students, <coughs> particularly for young students. They need to be learned in context of phenomena where, say, the idea of air pressure helps me explain what happens when I blow up a balloon <coughs> and why the balloon goes, <sighs> and goes down again if I let it go. So, taking real phenomena and using them as the context in which to introduce the science idea. That means you have rich and varied contexts appearing in the classroom in phenomena and materials, and that creates an opportunity and a desire for the students to engage with realia, with real things. And that means and to talk about them. But that means you need the words to talk about them. So, the fact is, science has a lot of very science-specific language. Why? Because in order to talk about things, you need <coughs> the specific words. I mean, if I'm trying to explain how your bicycle works, and I say the thing of it goes around and the, the what's it does this, it's not nearly as good as if I say the pedals go around and the chain connects the cogs and the gears to the cogs on the drive shaft that you're pedaling with. So the whole language that is developed for specifically saying what I specifically want to say is needed to 
talk about science. And then when the student needs it and wants it and learns it, not because you gave them a vocabulary list, but because they need it to tell their idea to the next student there. Of course, to learn the science, you need all kinds of support from the teacher that helps you understand what it is you're supposed to be learning out of this lesson. And you need that the teacher accepts the student's expression of their science ideas incomplete and flawed in the sense of this is what the real scientists say. You don't say, the, the student expresses an idea, oh no, that's not right, it's this. You say, well, I, that's an interesting idea. How, do you, how would you test to see if that idea works? Or how would you refine your model to make it more like what we're actually observing here? The whole support of the student doing the thinking and the student building the knowledge requires you to accept their ideas even when they're wrong or incomplete as the basis for the further learning. And not to be always looking for what's the right answer here. So that's learning science. Now look at learning language. Story's exactly the same, folks. You need a rich context with opportunities to use and repeat and use the language in context. You need the equipment, the, the things that make you, that you want to talk about and that make you want to speak. One of the biggest barriers for language <coughs> in the classroom is opening their mouth and saying something. Because they know they won't say it right. And if the classroom is a classroom where right and wrong is all that matters, then I better not keep open my mouth. But if the classroom is a classroom where ideas are being pursued, and you're dealing with stuff and you're trying to explain something that's happening, the kid with limited English has just as much opportunity to get engaged with the phenomenon as the kid with very sophisticated and complex English. And once they're engaged with the ph phenomenon, they're very motivated to say and stretch their ideas and respond to other students' ideas. So one of the things that the science context gives you is the motivation to speak, the motivation to write, the motivation to listen carefully to what somebody else is saying and understand it. Because that's what you have to do to engage with the phenomenon. Of course, again, you need appropriate supports for the learning. And you need, as I've said several times already, you need acceptance of incorrect language and incomplete sentences and struggling to express yourself. And that's true as much for the English learner as it is for the student whose English is competent, but because they're still struggling to understand this particular phenomenon, they haven't really got it formed into a very well expressed idea. That's fine. That supports language learning. <coughs> Move ahead to the other slide, did I? How language develops is the other slide. It says the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so the whole piece of how does it work, there's a very strong parallel between science learning and language learning in a phenomenon rich science learning experience. And so it makes, therefore, it's natural that the science provides the context in which the language learning occurs. And the language learning is necessary to support the science learning. So a science teacher tends to reject, my job is not to teach language, my job is to teach science. But you cannot teach science unless the students can express their ideas and the students can read what they're expected to read or they can write what they're thinking in their science notebook. So if you structure your science classroom around science understanding, you're structuring your science classroom around language learning too. And therefore, it's a natural pairing to make this. Of course, it's not a language learning opportunity unless you really pay attention, manage to assure that the culture of the classroom respects ideas rather than individuals power in a, in a hierarchical power structure in the room, respects contributions, and provides a variety of supports, depending on the level needed for the different students in the classroom. A juggling act, I agree, for teachers. But this managing for inclusion, if you're going to have a discourse-rich classroom, 
many viewing the, the culture of that discourse as an important part of making that classroom work, just as managing the, the seating of the students and the grouping that they're moving into and how they, all of this is part of classroom management that plays into who's learning what when and figuring out how to structure your classroom and to develop that culture where it's, it's okay to disagree with somebody, but you don't say, you're stupid. You say, I don't think, I, I, I think the same way, I have a different idea. Here's my idea, let's compare and see which one works best. The whole culture of argumentative discourse <coughs> is something students generally have not learned outside of the classroom. Because our culture today is not very good at argumentative discourse with the argument being based on evidence and not on who's more powerful or who's louder. So building that culture so you can have real argumentative discourse between students in the classroom, that's a piece of support that is really important. And part of that is making sure that all voices get heard no matter what the status of the student is in, in socioeconomic terms or in language development terms. So these messages are obvious, but it's not easy to do it. Right? Making it happen that way takes really thinking through how do you structure and, and have the students really integrate a set of rules for behavior into how classroom discourse happens. And that is common across whether it's classroom discourse in math, or in science, or in language arts, or any place else in the classroom. So trying to develop in the school a culture of, of argumentative discourse in the classroom is important too. Now let's look at some really science-specific issues in language, right? Uh, yes, there's a lot of technical terminology. That is a challenge for all students because students don't come in knowing the science of the vocabulary. So there's the language learning around technical language. There's the words like analyze consequently, they're called academic or level two or whatever language words. Again, very few students enter into first grade speaking that way. So all of them are going to be learning these, this language in the classroom. And it supporting the building of that language and the usage of that language. Again, the exploratory people, I was talking to the, you know, the second grade classroom and the third grade classroom. They've been doing it for a couple of years. The students said to the third, the third grade teacher said, it's really amazing. The kids are coming in and they say, my claim, I observe this and my claim is that. Well, that's language they've learned by doing it, by practicing it in the second grade classroom. And now they bring it to the third grade classroom and it makes it easier for the third grade teacher to build on that and take it a step further and, and say, therefore this happens or consequently that happens. Be able to add those links. You're not going to read those words necessarily in the technical third grade, but you can use them. And, no, and thinking that students' language usage and their writing ability or reading ability is totally linked with another place where we have to break down some things. Young children can use very sophisticated language if they learn it in context and in practice of use. And then when they have to read it, they have it to be able to use. So supporting that. The other thing is, <coughs> if you're trying to read science, we as scientists tend to write long, multi-clause sentences. Why? Because we want to put in a lot of qualifiers and conditions and be very specific about which. And you know what hangs up the kid? It's the word, the thing, the, the whatever, that, did that. The that or the which or the, the connectors. If you take the that and refer, think it refers to the wrong piece of the previous two clauses in the sentence, you're not going to understand the sentence. 